What we say we are primarily is a digital experience design agency, which is usually about sticking pink posties on. on. <laughs> and what we do is um, we help our clients build more rewarding um, customer experiences. And historically, there used to be um, just websites, but as we all know, they now include um, apps and mobile experiences as well, um, and also other digital experiences. Um, we um, for TVNZ, things like uh, PlayStation 3 and also um, custom service applications. And a really good example of um, the power of user experience and, and shows um, that it's not necessarily a soft metric is when MySpace first began it was, um, it was kind of a pioneer in user experience design in terms of creating an environment people could uh, understand how they might um, talk to um, their social network and start making those connections. And one of the reasons why it was so powerful was people had a feeling about um, community and being able to stay in contact with each other. And that's how they grew and became quite successful. And then what happened is people started using a different service. And, and you saw how quickly a superior user experience caused MySpace to really struggle. And if you spoke to anyone that was using Facebook at the same time as they were using MySpace and why are they changing, they would say things like, you know, this feels clunky, or, um, um, MySpace feels clunky, or it feels old. And the word they used to use was feels, right? It's still about a feeling. It's, there's nothing more to it than that. And I was um, listening before to the previous speakers, and the amount of times that they used the words feel was, is, was you know, very, very frequent. So it is quite a soft, um, a soft word, but it is very, very powerful. It's kind of scary when you think about that, the, the minimal barrier that exists and how quickly people can move. Um, but it also creates really interesting opportunities. Some of you guys might be familiar with Mailbox, but I'll be honest, I think if anybody had come to me you know, three months ago and said, oh, we're building an email client for the, um, the iPhone. I would say, well, you're wasting your time. There's already one on the device that Apple made, so it must be good. And if you don't like that one, then this other small startup called Google have got one as well. So why would you go about trying to take them on? And these guys did, and if anybody's used it, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing user experience. It's really focused on um, rethinking uh, the mental model that people have around email and not making an email client that's beholden to the um, the conventions of um, email clients that we've had over the years. And this was in the market for a month before Dropbox bought it for $100 million. So there's, you know, there's, there's definite opportunities to rethink things that already exist. So this brings us to TVNZ. Now, the initial response that you have when you think about TVNZ is, does user experience really matter to them? They've got products, they've got content that they've licensed for people overseas. I either like Grey's Anatomy or I don't. So I'll watch it. Surely they just need to put it out there and, and that'll be that. Um, but if you think about it for a sec, um, and, you, and you think about the content that we probably all access on our computers, we do it the easiest way, whether that's legal or not. And their competitors in the market are not just um, the media works in the skies, but it's basically any avenue that you can get to gain that content. And a lot of the other avenues that we can access content by, they're not restricted by commercial um, aspects. And a lot of the time they can create whatever technology they want and they can innovate a lot more quickly. So when we actually started working with TVZ before they launched their very first on-demand product back in the day. And their primary issue was people um, torrenting Shortland Street, which just seems kind of unusual. Like, it's on TV, you can record it. It's, it's pretty disposable. It's not this high-demand um, product. Um, but, but they found that it was. And so we're actually competing with any avenue that you can access content online. And a lot of those avenues um, are really easy. And some of them are legal. Um, and then even if you just take that to one side, you're also competing with other user experiences that can be used up in your entertainment time. And that can be just things like browsing the internet or um, watching videos on YouTube. So, so their primary goal is to make the best user experience possible to ensure that people are going to be consuming their content on their platforms um, and, and through their, um, their, their channels. So the, the project that I wanted to talk about today was um, On Demand for Mobile, which, which has been, it's been a year-long project, and as you've heard with um, the other speakers, this is an ongoing piece of work, which is something that I'll, I'll touch on shortly. Um, what, what we delivered in that time frame was a tablet and mobile um, experience across iOS and Android, um, all simultaneously. The, the Android um, development, release, uh, um, development cycle has got a release really, really soon. I'm an Android user, so I'm hanging out, although I've got a beta build, so I'm not too worried. Um, but, um, but, but it's been interesting to try and capture all of those devices and all of those use cases in, um, in one sequence. And I'll just share a bit of the process that we've been through with that. So, so from my point of view, um, user experience is not something that you, you create through, through, um, through just testing. 
and through research, you actually have to design it. You have to have a vision and you have to go through a process of creating it. And I think you've seen a couple of really great examples of that today in terms of the process that you go through. And there's a lot of models that you can use. There's a lot of processes that you can use. Um, obviously, Digital Arts Network, we've, we've got our own models that we use internally as well. But I've kind of abstracted it and just wanted to talk about it on quite a high level so that you can take this thinking back and use it however it applies to your organisations. And this is actually a daily cycle to how people um, consume TV. And understanding that daily cycle is really important. The days evolved. There was a, obviously a different pattern on the weekends, but really coming up with this model that looped back on itself is really important. So we, we came up with what we call the day trip, which was actually a 24-hour clock. And that clock has got a, um, some different um, channels in it. It's got, it's got the type of content that people use, the type of context in which people will be um, using the on-demand experience, and the types of devices that they will be, um, be using as well. And we're able to generate this for a lot of different people and start understanding overall um, what types of usage patterns there were. One of the really interesting things with um, on-demand is everybody says, oh, the great thing with on-demand is you get to decide what you want to watch. But a lot of TV watching, people don't want to do that at all. They want to go home, they want to hit a button, they want to sit back on the couch, and they want to be told what, they want to watch, what they're going to watch. And there's a sense that what you're watching right now, a whole lot of other people are watching. And there's, there's this weird sort of ephemeral community that exists around live TV. Um, and that's something that you actually have to acknowledge and realize how you're going to deliver. So that's part of the customer experience strategy we've got for TVNZ. It's not just about on demand, it's about making sure that you know, in the future you can turn on an app and there will be a show happening right now. You need a whole lot of people to share um, their point of view in terms of what models they see emerging. The day trip, I don't know where it came from, it came from a whole lot of people spending a whole lot of time and it kind of emerged. And, um, and I think the key is probably looking at frequency, that's a really good way to start. How often are people engaging with your touch point? If there's one way in, it's probably that. Um, and that immediately unlocked a way for us thinking about the whole, the whole experience. And we've got a lot of books on designing business processes and user experience diagrams, and we looked at a whole lot of them, and just they, none of them applied. They, they, were, they were useless. So I think what we also discovered was that this is really bespoke, that you actually have to try and create your own models. There's no one size fits all. In fact, I don't think there's seven sizes fits all. I think you actually have to go into this with a blank piece of paper and really articulate the models that work for your organization and the experience that you want to deliver. Once we had this model in place day trip and understanding how it's going to work, we needed to start conceptualising the interfaces that we were going to start building. And I think the key finding that we had from the research was, you know, on some levels the mental model that we're working with is quite simple, but there was a contradiction in it, which was, um, get out of my way, because I know what I want, content-wise, but you need to show me the way to what I want. And this isn't unusual in interface design, but it's a really interesting one when you say, look, let's, let's just let the content speak for itself. People will... Um, they really know what they want to watch on an on-demand experience, it's on-demand, um, so let's just put it there. But actually coming up with the simplest way to get there and, and a structure that makes sense to everybody um, is an interesting challenge when you're also trying to just make sure that the content is right there in front of you and it's generally easy to access. We, we, we discovered some really simple things, like you see here on the side that we've got uh, navigation that sits just here. And that just might seem like an obvious place to put it. <clears throat> But most of the navigation models that we're looking at tend to have those tabs along the top. We realise when you put them on the left, for tablet devices that people traditionally, um, most commonly hold them with their left hand and their thumb on the left hand side. And this allowed them to really quickly, without having to move their left hand, select genres and select um, um, a letter in the alphabet and move really quickly. So once we came up with that design, the speed at which people moved through the app was dramatically increased. It was quite rapid. Before they were kind of holding it and touching it, and you give them this one and they hold it in their hands and they just effortlessly work with their um, left thumb and they could still use the right to swipe through content and actually hit play, but it completely changed, um, changed the experience they had. Another thing we realised is you actually need to keep a little gap along the bottom of a list when you're returning results because if people are using it in bed, their duvet just covers a little bit of the screen. <laughs> See, it's little things, little things. <laughs> For me, developers are just as crucial in terms of delivering the best user experience possible as anyone else on the team. And having um, them genuinely involved and engaged in the project from the outset, um, and being fans of particular platforms and understanding how they work, gives them a really strong sense of empathy with users, and it also makes them an advocate for some of the things that we really want them to um, focus on delivering. Without, without having to tell them, oh, I want you to make it faster or smoother, they inherently have those desires as well. Um, I got TVNZ's approval to share some um, stats with you guys as well. 
So one thing we're really happy about was it's the um, most popular app on the App Store in New Zealand for over a month, um, which is kind of unheard of. Uh, we were beaten by Trade Me launching a new iPad app, which I think is kind of fair enough. That's a, that's a good one to be beaten by. Um, there's been close to 300,000 downloads to date. Um, and this is a really interesting stat. So over a third of our users are watching around three shows a week every week. So there's quite a large repeat cycle in there. That, that, that I think that's, this is um, much higher than on-demand um, traditional desktop platforms. And this is partly to do with the devices, but also I'd like to think it's because of the model that we've employed, understanding the day trip and making sure that people have that ability to watch shows um, with the type of frequency um, that the shows are brought to air and making sure that the content is constantly updated. Um, sometimes you have to be really careful that a vocal minority does not necessarily mean that you've made the wrong call. You have to be prepared for this type of response when it comes to some of the hard decisions you've made. Because you might have delivered a better user experience across the board, and you might have a few people that are upset. We all want airplay. TVNZ want airplay more than anybody else. And it was a really hard decision. Um, but you do have to accept that you will get this type of feedback. But I think it's also great to know that people are genuinely this keen on what, what's um, being delivered that they are so upset about you know, a feature like this not being there at launch. But what we've seen is um, a really great response to the work that we've put in um, to the app across all those platforms. And we've seen some great numbers and it'll be great to see when Android um, gets released how much that changes the game for them as well. Um, and I think that's pretty much me. Thanks.